Welcome. Today we're going to go over a brief topic and one that comes up all the time. My main motivation for putting this out is mostly as something I can refer people to when we don't have an opportunity to get into the nuts and bolts of calcium and vitamin D supplementation during a visit. I found that that's something that gets um, related to patients frequently, but we often don't give them enough information to be able to implement the instructions carefully and effectively. Osteoporosis and its less severe version, osteopenia, are common problems that ultimately result in lots of morbidity and mortality, and unfortunately, they tend to sneak up on you. You don't know you've got them until it's too late. Now, basically, this is weakening of the bones. It is more common in postmenopausal women and uh, can be seen in younger ages and can be seen uh, in men as well. And the way it tends to present is with a broken bone. That can be something spontaneous, like a vertebral compression fracture that just comes on unexpectedly, or it can be the result of a fall where your bones have lost their rigidity and their flexibility and you end up with a broken bone, which obviously can put you out of commission for quite some time and can have really uh, far-reaching effects on your health and wellness. Basically, the best thing that you can do for your bones is to eat a healthy diet and to be sure that you're getting plenty of activity and weight-bearing exercise. And that can be in the form of exercise, lifting weights, uh, or it can be just being active, doing things that use your bones and use your muscles. Gardening would be a good example that we've talked about some recently. So what are the recommendations for calcium? Well, basically, if you're in the postmenopausal category for females, you're looking at needing to get 1,200 milligrams of calcium per day and about 800 international units of vitamin D per day. That can be both from supplements or from your diet. Obviously, it's better if you can get it from your diet, but if you can't, there are some reasonable supplements that can be used. You also want to be sure you're not going over about two grams per day because the risk of having kidney stones and some other side effects can probably start to increase if you're taking in too much calcium. If you are in the premenopausal category or if you're a male, you're looking at about a thousand milligrams of calcium per day as your goal, which can again come from supplements or preferentially from your diet. If you are looking at these options, there are several versions of calcium and vitamin D supplements. And I wanna give you a little bit of guidance and some things to watch out for so that if you go through the effort, you make sure you get as much benefit as you can. So if you are in the premenopausal category for females or you're a male, you're gonna to wanna to shoot for about 1,000 milligrams of calcium per day and about 600 international units of vitamin D per day. Primary sources of calcium in the diet include milk and other dairy products such as hard cheese, yogurt, cottage cheese, and then you're also gonna find a reasonable amount in the leafy greens and green vegetables such as broccoli. And there are certainly other foods that have some. And if you're focusing on eating non-processed natural foods, you're gonna to tend to probably get enough in your diet over time. Now there are two forms of calcium that are commonly available in supplements. And there's some nuances here that really are important. Calcium carbonate, which is in a lot of supplements that are available over the counter, are gonna tend to be better absorbed if taken with some food. And it actually even is improved if you take it with food that is low in iron. Absorption of calcium carbonate can be decreased by medications that decrease the amount of acid in the stomach 
common examples would be your H2 blockers and your proton pump inhibitors. Calcium citrate, which is another form of calcium that's commonly available, actually doesn't really have this downside. It can be taken in the fasting state on an empty stomach, or it can be taken with meals. And it doesn't seem to affect it much at all. There's also been some concern that some of the calcium carbonate preparations might contain some lead because of the substances that they're made from, but really this is probably not enough to be concerned about. You also should keep in mind that calcium supplements that are above about 500 milligrams per dose really don't get absorbed as well. So if you're getting more than about 500 milligrams of your calcium from supplements, you're going to want to split that over multiple doses if possible. There are also some classes of medication that can kind of get in the way here, and they're worth thinking about. Some of your loop diuretics like furosemide or Lasix can actually cause you to lose calcium in your urine. Oddly, some of the other commonly used diuretics like hydrochlorothiazide can actually cause an increase in your calcium retention. Overall, calcium and supplements tend to be well tolerated, but some people do experience increased indigestion and in some cases constipation when they start taking a regimen of calcium supplements. Sometimes this will pass with a little bit of time, but if it's bothersome, it's something you can discuss with your provider, and they should be able to help you come up with a plan for how to navigate this or to deal with it. There is some evidence that taking calcium supplements can increase your risk of getting kidney stones, but oddly, there's not any increased risk of kidney stones if you have increased calcium intake from your diet. So again, if you can get it from your diet, from natural foods, that's preferential. Now, why does vitamin D get paired with calcium? Well, the reason for this is that when you are taking in calcium, you need vitamin D to absorb it in your intestinal tract. So we frequently think about the two together. Again, your, your daily goal is gonna be somewhere around 600 to 800 units or international units per day. And there's probably not as much that you need to think through when you're thinking about vitamin D supplements. There is some evidence that cholecalciferol or vitamin D3 is more effective than ergocalciferol, which is vitamin D2. When you look at the container, it'll say pretty clearly which version it is that is in the product that you're looking at. When it comes to sources of vitamin D that are in your diet, milk's going to be one of the common ones. It's also supplemented into some of your nut milks, almond milk, soy milk, coconut milk. It also is uh, present in large amounts in certain fish such as salmon. If you have deficiencies, you're going to want to check levels periodically and titrate your dosing. You don't want to go over probably about 2,000 international units a day of vitamin D without having been recommended to do so by a provider because over the long term, you could get into trouble if your levels get too high. I hope that this has been helpful. Please click below to subscribe. Hit the bell for notifications. We'll continue to put out short videos looking at things that are important that we frequently don't actually get to discuss in detail with our providers so that you have a resource so that you can go back and look at them later. As always, hope you have a blessed day. Thanks. Bye.